All right, so um, I'm not going to get any uh, points from Paul here because what I'm going to show you is more of like a, a desktop, traditionally desktop looking application on the web. Um, but I'll tell you why I think it's cool. One of the reasons, I mean, Paul actually gets dinged, I think, for, for pushing PHP so hard. Um, <laughs> I'm working with, uh, there's server-side JavaScript under the hood here. And if, if you didn't know already, server-side JavaScript is really cool. So even though we're looking at a little, maybe you could say it's an outdated interface, it's got really cool stuff under the hood. So I'm giving myself credit for that. Um, so a while ago, the, we started talking with the USGS about their national hydrography data set and the stewardship <laughs> program around that. Um, the USGS, uh, as you probably know, is shepherds this, the national hydrography data sets, lakes, streams, rivers, point features, wetlands, et cetera, for the, um, for the United States. And they have a stewardship program where each state is a potential steward. And uh, states can contribute, can edit that data, and, and can contribute to the, the national hydrography data set. Uh, the USGS has had a number of tools. They've gone through. They're now working on a third generation um, of their tool chain that works with ArcMap, uh, works with ArcGIS on the desktop. And it's basically an extension to ArcMap that enforces or, or guides users through this editing workflow. Uh, the USGS has a, a long list of topology rules that have to be enforced before anybody can make an edit. So you can't add a rapid, let's say, in the middle of a desert. You know, add, the rapid has to be associated with a, a linear um, uh, flow line. And uh, so anyway, there, there are these complex tools that are, are built into ArcMap. And the, the way that stewards can contribute data is to check out, to lock the database um, on the USGS side, check out a batch of data, work with this data on their own desktop, having downloaded and installed the, the editing tools. Um, and then when they're all done, they run through all the topology rules and make sure their edits are all valid. And then they submit that for a transaction. And they get an email back if it's accepted or when it, when it arrives. And the whole process to make a single edit, I'll stick with the waterfall example, just to add a single waterfall to say, the estimate takes between five and six hours just of, of editing and working on uh, through the desktop tools. And that's nothing to say for how long it takes them to incorporate it back into the canonical data set. So they came to us and we started talking to them about uh, sort of overhauling these or investigating what, what can be done with open source tools. And while we, um, we had a lot of ideas for different ways that we could streamline the editing, it was really important to them to, to still maintain all the, uh, the topology rule enforcement. And so we were targeting sort of mid-level people that are already sort of experienced with the national hydrography data set. This isn't just average users. We have talked to them about taking this further and actually building applications that average users, you know, could let's say add a water feature in their backyard or something. So this was really targeted again at someone who's already one of the stewards in one of the states already has experience with the national data <coughs> data set. The one thing we did convince them and, and did end up demonstrating um, the real potential of was putting this application on the web. So one thing I want to wrap up with is how our idea of how. Uh, other stewards, we, we put together an application that's a prototype of what the USGS could host, but there's potential for other states or individual stewards or anybody else who wants to contribute to the National Hydrography data set to use these same tools that are, are under the hood there. So this is what Paul was talking about. Um, we don't just have a single application and dictate a single way to do it. We provide services and let other people build applications on top of it. So I'm looking at an OpenStreetMap base layer here and a table of contents of layers. I've got the National Hydrography data set and some other layers from the National Map um, accessible here. And I'm going to turn on uh, the, the flow lines. I can change base layers. I think that, that aerial photography layer is a little dark for this setting. So I'll just stick with OpenStreetMap. Um, and uh, I'm going to go in and add that waterfall I keep talking about. So I've got tools on the top to create a new feature. And I'm going to click on the map. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm creating a water body. I didn't look at what I was doing. This is uh, Paul's critique about the active layer concept. We sell the concept of an active layer. I'm going to make the water features active and start editing a new point. So I'm dragging around a point on the map. And there are a number of attributes. Uh, we didn't work on making this form particularly pretty. Again, it's for people who already have some experience. I'm going to select to add a, uh, a waterfall. 
I've already actually, while I was sitting over there, made some previous edits. But it's also very important to for the USGS to capture metadata associated with a batch of edits. So I've already entered in my metadata. I'm keeping this as simple as possible. I'm just putting a little commit message in here. But I do have a full metadata record um, that I could add with my contact information. This would all be derived if I had logged into the application. And I'm going to try to save that uh, edit. So I just hit save. That waterfall WFS transaction went to the server. All the topology rules were run as individual processes. And the exception came back and said, you can't add a waterfall in the middle of this prairie or wherever you are. So I get a nice message back from the user that says, waterfalls must intersect one of the following uh, features, something from a flow line. So I can continue. I can recover from this edit, just keep, keep working here. And as I approach this streamline, you can see that there's context-sensitive snapping going on here. So as I approach the streamline, it encourages me to make the right decision. It doesn't want to let me put the waterfall in the middle. So now I've, I've snapped, I've put that waterfall in the correct location. I can go back to saving it again, and there I've just succeeded. So that was a complete editing transaction with metadata, all the topology rules enforced. And while I was talking, it took uh, two, two minutes, maybe, or something. So we felt like this was a pretty good accomplishment, a nice way to demonstrate that we could take this, the current process that involves five hours, check in, check out, and really try to streamline this um, in a web environment. And that, that was a pretty simple rule to enforce. There are a number of other rules that are enforced in this application. If I'm digitizing a new stream, um, I'm going to add a flow line here, or a stream, try to save that. And uh, that would break the network. The, the stream wouldn't flow there. It just is uh, kind of an orphan stream out in the middle. So I get an exception back here that I need either a sync or a rise, or I need to connect with an existing stream. So here I've got snapping engaged as well. You can see as I approach an existing stream feature, it's encouraging me to make the right kind of edit. I'm going to try to save that. And um, that transaction went through. I didn't anticipate that. Because the other rule, I'll tell you why, though. Things are still working. The other rule that needs to be enforced is that there needs to be a node uh, in, in an existing stream, um, in an, exi an existing flow line feature, when I'm adding a new one. So again, to allow the network uh, to be connected. Uh, previously, while I was just sitting over there, I did the same edit. And I got another exception that said, uh, you know, your, your flow lines must intersect existing ones. And I said, oh, just take care of it. Try to deal with it. Um, on the server. So I'll show you what that workflow looks like. Let's say I added a new stream. I correctly snap to an existing one. I'm going to create a new stream. Um, and here's the exception that I expected. Uh, this existing, this new flow line that you just put in there must uh, hit a point feature, a node and an existing one. I'm going to say just auto-correct this. I don't want to worry about this. Try to deal with it on the server. So when I auto-correct that and I reissue the the transaction that actually went and it split this existing feature into two. The, uh, the flow line that, that I just digitized as one feature is now split into two different flow lines, and so the whole network and um, the topology is maintained. The nice thing about this workflow and the thing that tripped me up is that these preferences are maintained in the application. So at any time, I can go back and, and I would have a a cumulative list here of all my preferences that are that I'm electing. I just want the server to deal with splitting flow lines. I don't have to do that on my side. And those are maintained here in this uh, preferences panel. I can also choose to do things like, let's say I did want to add a, uh, a point feature out here in the middle of nowhere. This is going to be a, uh, a rapid. And Rapids belong on, on existing flow lines, so I get an exception. I can also elect to queue this exception. If later I'm going to digitize some streams in this area or something, I might want to queue that exception until later. And that actually allows the transaction to go through. But there's a separate table that maintains this, uh, all the exceptions and which metadata records they're associated with. So I actually can't complete my, uh, my, whole, set, my whole session, I'm sorry until I've resolved all the exceptions associated with my metadata record. Um, so later I would go about and have to, to correct those before completing it. The point of this demonstration was to show, again, web-based editing. So I'm editing features in a browser, and I've got snapping enabled, and it's context-sensitive snapping. We have all these other layers from the national map here as well. 
and the rules are different for those, and the snapping rules are different for those. So for example, when I'm editing road segments or railroads, I don't snap to streams, instead I snap to existing roads or, or railroads. Um, all of this, uh, it will, it, the, the topology rules are enforced sort of in a combination of client-side logic and, and server-side logic. The snapping and all the editing and exception handling happens on the client, right in my browser. And then all the enforcement of the topology rules happens on the server before uh, the transaction is allowed. So all of this is using, I mentioned earlier, the GeoScript project. And we have an extension for GeoServer that brings GeoScript into GeoServer and allows you to script things like processes. So each of these topolo topology rules is implemented as a process. Martin, in the previous set of demos, showed how processes could be used in rendering transformations. Processes can also be called from, from different points. With this extension, the scripting extension for GeoServer, I can have a transaction hook. So I'm listening for before commit, after commit, different places in the transaction lifecycle, and I can call out to processes that are already there. So here's the GeoServer that's behind this demo. And if I look at the capabilities doc, um, I recognize this isn't a nice thing for people to really look at. But um, this is a, a list of the, the capabilities, all the processes that are in this GeoServer. And I can see some of these. I've got uh, this must-have vertical relationship process. So this is a process that enforces when you, when you digitize two flow lines over each other, you have to tell which one's on top, which one's on the bottom. I have processes about must intersect or must intersect endpoint. All of these things are involved in enforcing the topology rules. And the power in this comes in that other stewards, let's say in this case, could build their own applications. They could even be doing desktop editing, and they could access these processes on, on the USGS Geo server to validate their edits and say before submitting a batch of edits. So the point is that they don't even need to, a steward doesn't even need to use this particular application. They can still take advantage of the processes that GeoServer exposes. And because of the way that um, this GeoServer is configured, it won't actually allow transactions unless all of those rules are validated. So that, again, under the hood is all done in, in, in server-side JavaScript using this scripting extension. And I'm going to push it and show you an example here. Um, it's really silly, but um, <coughs> let's say I have a, uh, I'll show you some other ways that these, um, the scripting extension allows you folks into parts of GeoServer. So I've got this map of states and these labels you'll see all have uh, capitalized letters here. This data set, uh, I don't think you can see down at the bottom here, um, but the state name is actually in um, just, the, there's an uppercase P. So there's something in GeoServer called a filter function that lets you transform uh, things like geometries or attributes of features before, in this case, rendering them as labels. And if I go into my GeoServer and edit that state style, uh, you'll see perhaps that there's a function I'm calling here, a filter function called string to uppercase. So that takes this state name, casts it all to uppercase, and uh, then displays it on my map. Well, let's say I wanted to do something different. There are, uh, well, there's a, a, a wide variety of filter functions that already come with GeoServer that allow you to do string manipulation, numeric manipulation, manipulate geometries, etc. But I want to write my own. So I've come in here in, in JavaScript, because I like JavaScript. Uh, and I've written a function that um, takes, it's going to take a label in this case and do a couple things to it. So this is four or five lines of code. And uh, I don't know if anybody can guess what it does here, maybe based on the name. But basically says, if the first uh, letter is a vowel, then put the letter's way at the end of it. And if the first letter is not a vowel, then take that letter off, put it on the end, and add A to the word. I think everybody's asleep. Nobody can guess what that does yet? <laughs> so that's Pig Latin. Um, so I go and I, into my SLD, and I say, instead of using that uh, uppercase <coughs> function, I'm going to use the Pig Latin function. And then I jump in here and I go, I have Pennsylvania Day and Delaware Day and Virginia Day. Can you pronounce these things? 
So it, it's, I basically just wanted to demonstrate the power again of these um, the processes, filter functions in this case, and, and all of these are done with uh, the scripting extension. In this case, I've implemented <coughs> JavaScript in the server, but we also have support for Python, and in, in future, um, we hope to have uh, support for Scala, Ruby, Groovy, and other languages that run on the, on the JVM. So I think that's all I have for this round, but Pass it back to one.